it was remarkable how he took over games that season. What a great catch by Randy Moss! This is as good a running back as I've seen emerge from the college ranks in many, many years. Eric Dickerson, wow, he is awesome. And we all went. Rookies get a bum rap in the NFL. These guys come in this league. This ain't like playing Wake Forest now. They get hazed. I promise you, no lie, I can't even feel my arms or legs. Struggle to adjust. Rookies all over the place. Get them lined up right. And just plain picked on. The ball, no, no, don't move my ball, rook. Get your ass back. But there are a precious few who break the mold. Has the kid from Boston College been good today or what? To make our list, you need both individual and team success. The Steelers win in overtime. Without further ado, the top 10 rookie seasons of all time. The number 10 rookie season of all time, Adrian Peterson. Who, who made up this list? Hand off Adrian Peterson. I mean, who made, how could he be number 10? This guy is insane. He is the best running back I remember coming in the league for a long time. I have not seen that kind of speed, that kind of size, that kind of strength in one running back, maybe ever in my lifetime. With the seventh pick in the 2007 NFL Draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Adrian Peterson. Despite running for more than 1,300 yards and 12 touchdowns in only nine games in 2007, our number 10 rookie still can't dodge his skeptics. I think Adrian Peterson is a little overrated. I think he's soft. Uh, he'll have a big game, then he'll disappear for a couple games. I'm not a, uh, a huge Adrian Peterson fan. He was a dominant player on a team that had the offensive line to allow his skills as a running back to shine. But even Peterson's biggest doubters couldn't deny how impressive he was against the Bears in Week 6. He had over two... 100 yards rushing in a game against the Chicago Bear defense. That was one of the best in the National Football League. Runs through a bear, and Adrian He's close. He's inside He's the going. 30 to the 20. Great block by Ferguson. Touchdown! He was against what I thought was a pretty good defense that all of a sudden looked like a Pop Warner team trying to catch him. He breaks the tackle, and Adrian Peterson is loose! All of a sudden, these guys who were supposed to be so good couldn't touch him. And Adrian Peterson is gone! I didn't want to believe the hype on Adrian Peterson when halfway through his rookie season people are saying he's one of the greatest running backs ever and he's only played like seven games and then he played the San Diego Chargers. Jackson hands the ball off to Peterson. Hand off Adrian Peterson. 20 carries, 145 yards. 23 carries, 186 yards. Uncle, I mean seriously. It was two yards here, three yards here, but soon later, you know, it's gonna come open. And he rips off 296 yards against that defense. Sold, okay. 296 yards for Adrian Peterson, the greatest rushing performance in the history of the National Football League. Our number 10 rookie season ended in Hawaii, but to Peterson, the Pro Bowl was no vacation. I remember being at the Pro Bowl and uh, him being real serious over there, and I was on the other side saying, uh-oh, and sure enough, MVP for him. But it was a football game for him, and he was going to play hard, and I liked that about him. The offensive linemen who blocked for him, who weren't his teammates, just were amazed by the effort that he showed. And it wasn't just a case of a rookie not knowing you're supposed to slow down a little bit in the Pro Bowl. He just knows one speed. I think he got shortchanged at 10. That's probably too low for him. I think he had a, an incredible impact right away in this league. And I'll tell you what. He's good. The Lions will get their hats handed to him, but that kid is sick. 
and wondered when, if ever, will the defenders catch up to him in uh, that rookie season. The more and more he did, you just started to think that maybe they just can't catch up to him. Maybe this guy really is that good. Can you guess which of these quarterbacks made our list? Find out after this. It was a tremendous rookie season. It's rare for a rookie quarterback to make an impact in the NFL. Back in 1983, even John Elway looked like a bust in his first season. But a few QBs have had early success. In 2008, two rookie quarterbacks, the Ravens' Joe Flacco and the Falcons' Matt Ryan, took over below 500 teams and led them to the playoffs. Oh, what a throw by Joe Flacco! A year later, Mark Sanchez followed their lead piloting the Jets on a trip to the AFC Championship game. At the 10-yard line, throws, end zone, caught! Yes! But all three got knocked off the list in favor of another gunslinger. The number nine rookie season of all time, Big Ben Roethlisberger. Well, the words magic carpet ride uh, come to mind when I think of Ben Roethlisberger's rookie season. I'm telling you, that was a terrific fight by Ben Put your seatbelt on. We're going for a hell of a ride, baby. In April of 2004, Big Ben left small town Ohio, only to end up the last man sitting at the draft. He's sitting in the green room on draft day 2004. He's watching Eli Manning, Philip Rivers come off the top. Robert Gallery, Reggie Williams, Dante Robinson. I honestly don't know. I don't know why he dropped. But boy, people in Pittsburgh are certainly glad it worked out the way it did. The Steelers drafted Ben Roethlisberger with the thought that he would be the man for years to come. But I know they didn't expect he'd have to do it that soon. You remember Tommy Maddox was supposed to be the Steelers starter that year? Hey, stay in the game, man. One play away. He gets hurt in the second game against the Ravens. Maddox, and look at Maddox. Tommy Maddox is hurt. He's holding that right arm. There is a new quarterback, and he is the rookie out of Miami of Ohio, Ben Roethlisberger. He gets into the game, and then the Steelers never stop winning. Ben is running right, running right. Throws the ball to the pylon, and the pass is caught for the touchdown. In 1976, Mike Krucek quarterback Pittsburgh to a then-NFL record six wins to start his career. Our number nine rookie more than doubled that mark, going 14-0. Throws it down the field. We got a Along the way, he helped end New England's record-winning streak at 21 games. He's trying to run under. He does. And Big Ben is for real. going to go to Pro Bowl 90 times. I think Ben Roethlisberger will tell you that he was able to do it because he had a really good running game and a dominating defense. I don't think Roethlisberger should have been on the list. I, I think that uh, Ben charmed the voters. When you look at his numbers that year, they were fairly pedestrian. I think Matt Ryan accomplished a lot more. I think Roethlisberger came in with a better defensive team. Matt Ryan was took a bad team, put him in the playoffs. Going to throw first professional pass. Doug Jenkins, his first professional pass is a 62-yard strike to Michael Jenkins. Ben Roethlisberger succeeded in Pittsburgh for a number of reasons. They were a very complete team. But I don't buy for a second in the NFL that you can hide your quarterback. So he made some plays and made some throws. Whenever the Steelers called on Roethlisberger to make a big play, when necessity forced him to try to reach beyond his rookie status, he always delivered. Big Ben Roethlisberger, his first rushing touchdown. Bill Cowher has always said that Ben has a knack. And that knack is something that you can't teach. It's a tremendous rookie season. Our number nine rookie only lost one game in 2004, and that was the AFC Championship. Throws the up oh, picked off, and look out, he's going up yeah. the sideline. Ben Roethlisberger came in as a stone-cold rookie who had no aspirations to start this year and only lost one game the whole year and that being a playoff game. It's hard to believe those other guys all did that much better than him. But who's above him? The number eight rookie season of all time, Kurt Warner.
Well, I think, uh, you know, Kurt Warner's rookie year was uh, was magical. I mean, he was bagging groceries, right? Uh, he went to Europe. He finally catches on with the Rams. The gateway to the West is now the gateway to the best football team in the world. Oh, is that, uh, that's not the Kurt Warner you're talking about? You want Kurt with a K or Kurt with a C? Actually, Kurt with a K's magical season in 1999 isn't eligible for our list because he wasn't a rookie. In 98, he'd been the Rams' backup. Until then, the most famous Kurt Warner in NFL lore still started with a C. Um, Kurt with a C. Remind me? You know what? Honestly, I don't remember a lot about that. Ah, oh, people don't remember Kurt Warner way up in Seattle. Led him to the playoffs. I remember Kurt Warner from Penn State, yeah. He was good. He comes out of the Penn State mold, supposed to be better than Lenny Moore, Franco Harris, John Capaletti. He's supposed to be the guy. The great running back out of Penn State with the Seahawks, he was a, he was a very underrated player. Outstanding running back. The Seahawks wanted our number eight rookie so bad, they traded their first, second, and third round picks to draft him third overall in 1983. I mean, they traded, you know, pretty much their first day draft to move up and take this guy. And it was when Chuck Knox had come in with this ground Chuck offensive philosophy. He had to have a back, you know, to run the offense he wanted to. And Kurt was the guy that he picked out. And on his first run of his rookie season, Seattle set to go with their first offensive play. Warner gets a pitch from Zorn, takes off around the left side. He goes 60 yards off the left sideline. Oh, that's right. With the Seahawks. What do you do? You just got to be mentally ready. Uh, I kind of compare it to playing uh, somebody like Nebraska or Notre Dame every week. You know, I always talk about north and south runners. I think that's a good way to put it with him. There wasn't a whole lot of, as they say, junk in the trunk. And I think that's one of the reasons Knox liked him so much is that you know he would run to the assigned hole and, and, and get in there and, and get what was necessary. He became the identity of that offense. Warner led the AFC in rushing with over 1,400 yards and also led Seattle to their first playoff appearance in franchise history. Touchdown Seahawks, Kurt Warner! Hello everybody, Pete Gross with Steve Rabel and a welcome to the Kingdom this afternoon as the Seahawks are going to be in the National League football playoffs and this is indeed a great day for the city of Seattle. I mean, he took a good team and made it a real good team. In one year, I mean, he took the Seahawks and took them right to the conference championship game. He was outstanding. Seahawks trail the Dolphins 20-17. Franklin's over the defense. Pitches to Warner. He takes off around the right side. He's at the five. Touchdown, Seahawks! Yeah, I think Kurt Warner for that year, I think you can put his rookie season up against anybody's. In his first game of 84, Warner tore his ACL and was lost for the year. Oh, Pete, he's hurt. He's, hurt. he's holding that right knee. He returned to have several successful seasons, but none as memorable as 1983. I think he kind of gets lost in the shuffle. I mean, he was a very outstanding running back, very underrated player. He just played great. One of the one of the most forgotten running backs, I think, in NFL history. I mean, that Kurt Warner with the Rams is amazing. He's unbelievable. Up next, find out which of these power backs pounded into our list of top ten rookie seasons. He had freight train power. He was a rhinoceros with a football. Some insurance companies try to lure you in with promises of... A lot of these guys on this list, you'll see a running back. It's probably the easiest transition position from college football into the National Football League because it's instinct. Either you can or you can't pick the hole. In fact, half of the players on our list are running backs. Some others nearly made it. In 1999, Edron James led the NFL in rushing in his first year. They give us to Edron. 40, 45, 50, 45, 40, he may go! Houston Oilers select Eddie George. In 1996, Eddie George rushed for over 1,300 yards. In 93, Jerome Bettis had over 1,400. Jerome Bettis, right up the middle. Both George and Bettis were compared to the back who beat them out on our list. The number seven rookie season of all time, Earl Campbell. 
There's no way you can make a list of the greatest rookie seasons without having 1978 on there. Oilers running back Earl Campbell. Touchdown to Conero! Well, if uh, Earl Campbell's not on your list, you shouldn't have a list. I remember in 1978, he had just won a Heisman Trophy as he had left the University of Texas. The first pick in the draft came to play for Bum Phillips, a coach who really wanted him. And when he drafted Earl first, a lot of people thought he's crazy. They'd seen him win the Heisman, but there were people that thought he's still overrated, that he was a four yards in a cloud of dust back, and he didn't realize how fast he was. Campbell busted this myth with one game in particular. I think of the Monday night football against the Miami Dolphins. That was uh, the Monday night game against the Dolphins. Uh, that was Earl Campbell's breakout performance, if you will, before uh, a national televised audience. Earl Campbell lit it up that night. And it was a real shootout. Greasy was hot. We were scoring a lot of points. They'd get the ball and give it to Earl Campbell, and they would score. Our number seven rookie finished the game with 199 yards rushing and four touchdowns, including an 82-yard sprint in the fourth quarter. Earl Campbell was frightening with a football under his arm. Campbell was like an optical illusion. His speed simply didn't fit his physical appearance. You know, you always remembered his butt, you know, the big butt, the thighs. Earl Campbell, I believe, had uh, thighs this big. You know, not many times as a young man I noticed another man's thighs. At that time, I had a 34 waist, and this guy had 36-inch thighs. We were always looking at Earl, if you saw him naked in the dressing room, because we were so impressed with his thighs. He also delivered what you'd expect from a man his size, the kind of power that makes people giddy with inventive comparisons. He had freight train power. He was a rhinoceros with a football. Continued a cattle stampede through the NFL. It's like tackling a Coke machine. I mean, he was a truck. He was a runaway freight train. It's like, boom, you just, hey, meet me, I'm Earl Campbell. You know, boom, hey, here, have, have some shoulder pad. Boom, here, have some elbow. Here, have some forearm. Defensive coordinators had to scratch your head every night and say, how are we going to stop this guy? You better have a brick wall in front of him, and that's the only way you're going to stop him. When the Oilers played the Los Angeles Rams that year, he gored Isaiah Robertson with his head right under his pads and lifted Robertson off the ground. And then as he broke away, tossed him to the side, kept going, hit somebody else, and three players ripped his jersey and were pulling it apart. We were amazed there wasn't a big red S underneath. And I'm sure Isaiah Robertson is probably still seeing Earl Campbell in his dreams. The man at number seven was named Offensive Rookie of the Year, as well as MVP of the entire league. He also led the Oilers to the 1978 AFC Championship and ushered in the Love You Blue era. Earl burst on the national scene and the Oilers burst on the national scene as well. And during that period with Earl Campbell, it's the first time the Oilers ever have eaten into the Cowboys' popularity all over the state of Texas. The number six rookie seasons of all time. Slinging Sammy Baugh and Bob Waterfield. I sometimes think players of that era and players of the stature of Baugh and Waterfield do get overlooked. But not on our list. Baugh's 1937 season and Waterfield's 1945 are memorable because both players led their teams to NFL titles. You couldn't write a script any better than that when you have a guy come in as a rookie and then guide his team to the NFL title. Just uh, truly spectacular. And it's Waterfield again doing the damage. The pass is complete in the end zone to Bob Shaw. This is the grip with fingers spread wide that gives the maximum control in passing. Sammy spots the receiver as he draws the ball back behind his ear and lets it fly. In his rookie year, he passed for over 1,100 yards, and the next closest quarterback to him at that same time was more than 200 yards behind him. It was a big deal when he passed for that yardage as a rookie because we were in that transformation state and the game was still evolving from run first, throw as a clearly a second choice. It's a word we use a lot, revolutionized, when we're talking about Sammy Ball, but he clearly revolutionized the passing game. 
I never thought I'd ever play in a championship game in the pro league, I'll just be honest with you. He takes the Redskins and they go into Chicago and beat George House's Bears. Here's Sammy Ball out there slinging Sammy, who's so accurate and so confident in his passing game that he's embarrassing, if you will, the Bears with his performance. Magical finish to a great season, and I think that was what set Sammy Ball apart throughout his career, is he always came up big in the big games and throwing three touchdowns, 335 yards in the title. What a way to finish your rookie season. Let's return to Bob Waterfield. Yep, he's going to give that melon a long toss and knock the pipe out of Fred Gerke's kisser. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Waterfield came into the league at a time we were coming out of a war, and he spent time in the military, so he was a man when he was a rookie. In slow motion, we watch Bob Waterfield, the Rams' star passer, get off a perfect touchdown heap to Tom Fears in the end zone. The Rams had never been a very good team, and the year they got Waterfield, they were 9-1 and one in the regular season. He was a basketball player at UCLA, and uh, he was a gymnast letterman there. Uh, he was a scratch golfer at the golf club. There wasn't much he could not do. The redoubtable Robert will kick the ball 40 yards and smash it through that hoop. I hope. Yo, imagine that. In his rookie year, uh, their championship game was against the Redskins. It was a very nip and tuck game, played in very tough weather conditions, bitter cold. And Waterfield played extremely well, uh, threw two touchdown passes. Cleveland's ace Bob Waterfield takes to the air, hits Jim Benton on the 12 yard line, and he goes over to give Cleveland an 8 to 7 lead. The winning point in the game was a Bob Waterfield extra point that hit the crossbar and bounced over. What proved to be the margin of victory came as Waterfield's try for the extra point hits the crossbar and wobbles over to give the Rams a half-time margin of 9-7. to seven. What Baugh did in 37 and what Waterfield did in 45 in terms of taking teams that weren't very good and leading them all the way to a championship and then winning it as a rookie quarterback, to me that's a milestone accomplishment in any era. Up next, the cream of the crop from the quarterback class of 1983. You just knew you were watching the beginning of something really special. Perfectly thrown pass by Dan Marino. Otis Taylor is talking to me. We're counting down the top 10 rookie seasons of all time. Here are numbers 10 through 6. Number 10, Vikings rookie sensation Adrian Peterson. That kid is sick. Number 9, the Steelers once in a lifetime gunslinger. There had never been a quarterback who had a season like that. Number 8, Kurt Warner takes the Emerald City by storm. Number 7, Earl Campbell is an unstoppable force. You better have a brick wall in front of him, that's the only way you're going to stop him. Number 6, two rookie quarterback champions. What Baugh did in 37 and what Waterfield did in 45 is just remarkable. And now, the number five rookie season of all time, Dan Marino. It is hard to imagine anybody burst onto the scene uh, in more spectacular fashion than Dan Marino. In the quarterback-rich draft of 1983, Marino plummeted to the 27th pick. How many teams do you think were kicking themselves after one season going, I can't believe we let Dan Marino fall that far in the draft? Marino in the shotgun. He goes deep downfield. It is caught by Dupler. He's got to go. We had no idea of taking a quarterback. You know, we'd been to the Super Bowl with David Woodley as our quarterback. But uh, when it looked like Dan might slide down to us, that's when we started to really think about changing our direction. When you talk about draft mistakes, you know, there's a long line of people who passed on Dan Marino that probably still regret it to this day. From the day he took over, you could see there was something special. The Dolphins were last in the league in passing and 23rd in scoring. Don Shula was compelled to make a change. His forces needed a shot in the arm. 
Judah's decision, go with the rookie. The first game he started was against Buffalo. Two of his first passes were intercepted. And he came back to the sideline, and Bob Kuchenberg, here's his rookie, who had thrown two picks, comes up behind him and smacks him on the back and says, don't get down, we're going to get him next time out there. Moreno drops the throw, has time, going deep up the sideline, man down, got it, 30, 25, 20, Duplo, they'll never catch him, touchdown! It was a coming out party. The Dolphins lost that game against Buffalo, but when you saw Marino and how well he played, you just knew you were watching the beginning of something really special. Marino would lead the AFC in passing and his team to a division title, all while changing the way his Hall of Fame coach approached offense. But you knew the way Marino performed that things had changed. Shula changed. You know, the Dolphins with Woodley were not a throwing team. Someone had to be able to move the offense to put the points on the board, and fortunately I've had some success, and we've been able to score some points and win some games. You talk about championship courage. You talk about a will to win. A flame burns inside that man, Dan Marino. When we had Marino, all the defensive coaches in the National Football League would have patted me on the back if I made him hand off. So we let Marino throw it on every down to get the most out of his ability. Marino going deep, far side, man open, touchdown! To do it as a quarterback is still more shocking uh, than to do it in any other position. Most important position by far is the quarterback position. And for him to come into the NFL and master the game so quickly, I think merits him much higher ranking than that, if not the number one spot on the list. The number four rookie season of all time, Gale Sayers. I think Sayers' rookie year is the greatest rookie year of any player. The Bears took Gale Sayers in the 1965 draft, and the rest of the season was a cosmic event. His nickname coming out of college was the Kansas Comet. Sayers, the Kansas Comet, off flanks a pair of track packer backs as he sweeps into the end zone to put the Bears on the scoreboard. When you saw him run, yeah, it, it was like watching a comet streak across the heavens. Give me 18 inches of daylight. That's all I need. With my God-given talent, all I needed was a little crease over here. And Sayers gives Green Bay a set. Just give me a, a hold there, I get there. Gale Sayers was just an unbelievable football player. It's Gallup and Gale Sayers to the rescue as the most exciting runner to explode on the NFL scene in years. When Gale Sayers burst onto the scene, I used that word burst. That's exactly what he did. He sent notice to the National Football League, I'm an impact player. Of the year, Gale Sayers, 61 mercurial yards, give the lead to the Bears. Our number four rookie season included a record time six touchdown game. If we had a record book on the sidelines, I probably could have scored nine touchdowns. The incandescent Sayers goes careening into the corner with another touchdown. Well, everybody was playing on a muddy field except him. I would have to say, in the history of football, it was the greatest single game display I've ever seen. Bears coach George Hallis said that's the greatest performance I've ever seen on the football field. And George Howells had been around since 1919, and he had never seen anything to compare to that. Bear fans are reveling in every yard and every point of Gale's fantastic performance. But I tell you, it was you know, a good ball game. One of the reasons that Sayers rookie season was so great was that he scored touchdowns so many different ways. Kickoff, punt return, running, catching, anything, he could literally get touched on any time he touched the ball. Here he is, galloping Gale, carrying the mail. He was immediately the best kick returner in all of football, and that's both kickoffs and punts. I mean, he averaged over 14 yards per punt return, and he averaged more than 30 yards on a kickoff return. I mean, he was about as close to untackleable as any player you're ever going to see. Sayers' rookie season is good enough for number four on our list, but how much better could he have been in a 16-game season? He really only played 12 full games and yet scored 22 touchdowns. It was in this game that Gale began to gather his rave reports and the reasons are up. He only touched the ball 
232 times that season. So he was averaging a touchdown about every 10 times he touched the ball. Other guys who've broken the record over the years, all 350 to 400 touches in the season. It's amazing. If I had to pick what I think is the greatest rookie year in NFL history, it would be Sayers in Chicago. Coming up, the defensive whirlwind that revolutionized his position. We never seen anybody that ferocious, that talented in pro football ever. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. That's some fun. Throughout NFL history, there have been a number of great defensive rookies, but only one made our list. Dropped by Indomitian Sue. In 2010, Indomitian Sue became the first rookie defensive lineman named first team All Pro since Javon Kurse back in 1999. In 1952, Dick Knight Train Lane set the NFL record for most interceptions in a season by anyone, rookie or veteran. He picked off 14 passes in one season. That was a 12-game season. In 1981, rookie Ronnie Lott had the same kind of impact, helping San Francisco win the Super Bowl. But he didn't win Rookie of the Year because of another groundbreaking defender. The number three rookie season of all time, Lawrence Taylor. Uh, you probably got to put LT higher. I mean, remember one thing about the Giants. The Giants have gone 18 years without making a playoff. You know, they draft Taylor, and he turned it all around. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. That's some fun. Lawrence Taylor was a havoc creator. Hey, we're a bunch of bad son of a this crazy ball. Lawrence Taylor comes on the scene, and we never see anybody that ferocious, that talented in pro football ever. Son, I got to do better than this. The New York Giants, first round selection, Lawrence Taylor, linebacker, North Carolina. Our number three rookie season began with a contract dispute that ruffled a few feathers. He caused such a star that he was asking for this kind of money. He was asking for something like $250,000 or $350,000 a year. The Giant players revolted until they saw him at training camp. And they said, you know what, he deserves more than that. They took him out of the first inter-squad scrimmage that I was there with. At the first eight plays, he had six sacks. All six pass attempts, they took him out of practice. Ray Perkins was the uh, head coach, and he devised a scoring system for the defense. Four points for an interception, three for a sack, two for a fumble, something like that. And the final score was defense 19, offense nothing. And Lawrence accounted for 12 of the 19 points. And then, of course, there was Lawrence Taylor, the finest young defensive player to come to pro football in many seasons. We're watching the film. We think we're looking at some guy that's maybe like 6'1 or 6'2. What we didn't understand was when we went to the Meadowlands and we're on the field warming up, and all of a sudden here comes 56 running out the tunnel. And we all went. His first game was against the Eagles, and they beat him that year. But watching that game, you go, this team is going to have trouble blocking this guy for the next 10 years. I went to the movies and saw Superman 1, and I went to the movies and I saw Superman 2. But then I said to myself, I said, now I'm playing with Superman 3, and that's Lawrence Taylor. He's flat-footed, and on the snap, he's in a full sprint. I mean, that's a freak of nature. Lawrence Taylor changed the game. He was such a freakish athlete. Before then, I don't recall teams planning for outside linebackers. He's changed the game of football uh, because he's just so dominating. He used to be that you'd say, well, our back block's him, and we go ahead and throw the pass. If you get a back block in Lawrence Taylor, you lose. Taylor was instrumental in the Giants' playoff clinching win versus the Cowboys, their first postseason in 18 years. He took the New York Giants, who were awful, right to the playoffs his rookie year. Put him on his back. He was unstoppable. This is what you've been waiting for. This is what the whole town has waited for. And I was able to cause a fumble. Uh, needless to say, this place went crazy. LT is the greatest defensive presence in the history of the National Football League. Hey, Sully, man, I hope I never get back in there. I will kick your And he changed the way the linebacker's position was meant to be. Where are you going to put? You're going to put Randy Moss ahead of him? 
he was really a hound dog. I mean, he just changed the way the game was played. He scared so many offensive coordinators. I might put LT a little higher on that list. Coming up, find out who won the race to the number two rookie season of all time. When he put the pads on, it was as if he was still running track. It was beautiful to watch. Few players have instantly made us see their positions in a new way. Long before he was a head coach, Mike Ditka reinvented the tight end position as a rookie in 1961. He was the first tight end to become a feared pass receiver, logging over a thousand yards and 12 touchdowns in his first season alone. Iron Mike Ditka, did he get the nickname back in the 60s or when he started doing the Levitra commercials? After capturing a pair of gold medals at the Olympics, bullet Bob Hayes brought a new breed of speed to the NFL in 1965. Bob Hayes is a charter member of Speed Incorporated. And in 1989, Barry Sanders immediately proved to be one of the most electrifying runners in history. But his rookie year wasn't quite as groundbreaking as another back who rolled into Los Angeles in 1983. The number two rookie season of all time. Eric Dickerson. At running back, number 29, Eric Dickerson. 1,808 yards as a rookie NFL record. Dickerson cuts up inside the 45-40, look out! 390 carries as a rookie NFL record. Guy sets the single season record for carries by a running back as a rookie. Gets 20 touchdowns combined, rushing and receiving. No rookie had ever done that before. Eric Dickerson, he's got to be your number one rookie season of all time. In the 83 draft, Los Angeles traded up to the number two pick so they could bring this Texas star to town. In 1983, when Eric Dickerson came to the Los Angeles Rams, you know, he was like Magic Johnson. He came to a showtime town and really lit it up. He would take the ball going downhill, and everyone would just show up just to see Eric Dickerson run the football. The thing that impressed me was that Eric Dickerson was so tall. I mean, really, Eric Dickerson could have been a power forward in the NBA. Eric Dickerson, wow, he is awesome. What Dickerson brought to the table, which was different, was his size-speed ratio. The man was 225 pounds and was a sprinter. I don't know that defenders were ready for his kind of speed. He was a track star at SMU, and it translated well to the National Football League. When he put the pads on, it was as if he was still running track. He went to a coach in John Robinson who was all about the eye formation and run and toss right and toss left, the USC approach. Dickerson was accustomed to the Rams' new system because it was the same as he had run at SMU, where he was one half of the Pony Express backfield with Craig James. Think about this. Eric Dickerson, Hall of Fame running back, one of the two greatest rookie years in history, split time with Craig James, a broadcaster at SMU. I think what we saw once he came to the NFL and he got to be the man, the back. Ran to the left side. <laughs> hey, this guy could put up 2,000 yards and I think the rest is history. 35 to the 40, to the 45, to the 50. Down to the 35, down to the 25, down to the 10. Five, touchdown, Eric Dickerson. 85 yards. Only a guy with that kind of skill can make Rex Bex popular. All that padding, all that protection, the goggles, I mean, he looked like a spaceman in a football uniform. After taking off in his rookie season, Dickerson entered the upper strata of NFL stardom when he rushed for 2,105 yards in 1984, breaking O.J. Simpson's record for rushing yards in a season. And a brand new single season rushing record for the outstanding star from Southern Methodist. I definitely believe that Eric Dickerson probably should have been the number one guy in terms of rookie impact. Up next, our choice for the greatest rookie season of all time has everyone fired up. Who made up that list? What, did somebody throw darts? What a magical receiver that guy is.
Before we unveil the greatest rookie season of all time, here's a look at numbers 10 through 2. Number 10, Adrian Peterson drives opposing defenses crazy. This guy is insane. Number 9, Big Ben is a Steel City savior. Like a Pro Bowl 90 time. Number 8, Kurt Warner with a C gets straight A's. Oh, people don't remember Kurt Warner way up in Seattle. He was good. Number 7, Earl Campbell hammers his way onto the NFL scene. It's like tackling a Coke machine. Number 6, Paw and Waterfield go all the way. And it's Waterfield again doing the damage. Number 5, Marino makes a big splash in Miami. From the day he took over, you could see there was something special. Number 4, Sayers delivers the goods for the Bears. Here he is, Galloping Gale, carrying the mail. Number 3, LT leaves offenses in his wing. Lawrence Taylor was a havoc creator. Number two, the Rams record setting back. Touchdown, Eric Dickerson! And now, the number one rookie season of all time, Randy Moss. Can you have the impact that an Oral Campbell had, maybe a Matt Ryan had, maybe Eric Dickerson? You can debate that, but you can't debate Randy Moss's talent the day he stepped on the field in the NFL. Our debate ends with Randy Moss. His 17 touchdowns and more than 1,300 yards receiving propelled the Vikings to within a missed field goal of the Super Bowl in 1998. They went 15-1, and one, and they broke the NFL scoring record of 556 points. I believe it began and ended with what Randy Moss was able to do. What a magical receiver that guy is. There's only one other wide receiver since 1970 who's had more than 10 touchdowns in the rookie year. Randy Moss was just off the charts. Look at the Moss in single coverage. He caught it. He's the best in the game. Touchdown, Vikings! With the uh, first pick of the draft, ninth pick in the draft, the Dallas Cowboys select Robert Edwards, Curtis Enos, Anthony Simmons, Kevin Dyson. He dropped drastically in the NFL draft. He had some negative things in college. God, who, who doesn't? And it's amazing to think about how many teams took Randy Moss off their draft boards because of his personal issues and allowed the Vikings to get such a steal and put that guy next to Chris Carter. He has such great passion for football and he has such love of the game and he has such intelligence for playing the position that he was never going to let any mistakes he made off the field affect his ability to play on the field. That Ray Buchanan cannot guard me. No, I know that. He I cannot that. guard me. Looking back, there's 10 to 15 teams that would have said, my bad, we should have done that, we should have gotten Randy. Our number one rookie season of all time was a tale of vengeance, especially on Thanksgiving Day versus the Cowboys. Randy kind of took that personal. You know, Randy was on a mission. Fires deep, got Moss, 10, 5, touchdown, Vikings! This was very clearly one of the games that he really wanted to show the league, and in particular the Dallas Cowboys. You made a mistake by not taking it. We playing today, you ain't got to worry about us. Three catches, three touchdowns. Oh, another touchdown, touchdown Vikings! That was pure speed. I remember now, well over a decade, Jerry Jones regretting what he did in that draft. Rookie of the year, Moss! It was remarkable how he took over games that season. Touchdown, Randy Moss! We just haven't seen a player dominate at the receiver position like that in the history of pro football. What a great catch by Randy Moss! With Randy Moss, it, it, it's just freakish to see a guy who can run past the person trying to cover him, and then if anybody gets near him and soars so far above that guy, there was no chance to cover him. Lots right side into caught! Touchdown, Randy Moss! His rookie year, you knew that he was going to be one of the best wide receivers in the NFL for a decade to come, and he hasn't let us down. There's no way you can tell me this guy isn't the greatest receiver in the league. Our list of the top rookie seasons of all time is complete, with a few notable objections. Who made up that list? Well, I'm not okay with it. That's what you guys did. The top rookie season of all time is Randy Moss's. Wait, did somebody throw darts? There had to be better rookie seasons to be remembering, other than Randy Moss's. I'm trying to figure out where Dick Butkus is on your list. Of course, another East Coast bias. 